um, are here, there is a little dot by this P, and that is the entire Milky Way. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, there is a little dot up here, and that is Andromeda, and all of the other things here are other different galaxies. Now, what you're going to start to notice here is that these galaxies aren't randomly positioned. Am I? Is that? Okay. Better? Yes. Okay. So, um, the galaxies in this picture aren't randomly positioned, right? There's some structure, there's some pattern to what you're seeing. And this pattern is on extraordinarily large scales. So you see from here to here is 50 million light years. And I'm not going to be asking you to imagine how big that is because after 10 years in this profession, I still can't imagine how big 50 million light years really is. But it's really huge uh, part of space. But now let's go even further than that. So this is 50 million light years. The next picture you're going to see, you are here. Again, every one of these dots is a galaxy. And from here to here is 2 billion, billion, 2 billion light years. Huge, uh, you know, slot, uh, 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 huge part of space. Um, and this pattern, I hope, is becoming, you know, even more evident here. So there are empty spots and there are spots where galaxies like to cluster together. And when I look at this picture, it actually reminds me, you know, this is really unbelievable scales. It's very hard to imagine what this is. But when I look at this picture, uh, it reminds me of something that is actually quite familiar. Uh, and that is uh, night, um, you know, night Earth view of Europe. And again, you see that some lights are clustered together very closely. There's parts that are more or less dark. And these parts are you know, connected to each other by roads that, let's say, connect the larger, uh, the larger cities. And you have little villages along these roads. Now, we know how this came to be, right? We built it. But how did this structure happen? And why do they look so similar? Well, much in the same way as at the very beginning, uh, this didn't exist. We just had a bunch of scattered campfires and everything was more or less dark. At the beginning of the universe, uh, matter was pretty much very evenly distributed everywhere. There was the same density of mass anywhere we looked in the universe right after the Big Bang. Randomly, there were places where the density was just a tiny, 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 tiny little bit higher than in other places. So what we're going to do here is we assigned this random uh, uniform distribution of, of mass. Uh, each of these points has a mass. Each of these points interacts gravitationally, feels the gravitational pull from every other point in this box. We're going to let the computer do the calculation and uh, see uh, what gravity does to this cube. And by the way, this is my favorite movie in, of all time, pretty much. So here's what's going to happen. All you're seeing here is gravity. So sm small, relatively small structures get bigger, and they get more gravity, and they pull more of the matter in from around them, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you get uh, a you know, structure that is pretty similar to what we were seeing before. Uh, and what I study in everyday life um, is are these, these dense parts, these knots of the so-called cosmic web, the parts where, if you will, galaxies like to live together. And this is now a zooming picture with the Hubble Space Telescope of one of these clusters of galaxies. You see many, many, many different galaxies all together living in one place. This is what it looks like, again, in optical light. But of course, you're here today because you must have some inkling of the fact that the optical light is just a very tiny part of the light spectrum. This is optical light, but apart from optical light, we have infrared, we have ultraviolet, and if you go to even more energetic light than ultraviolet, you're going to have X-ray light. And whether you know it or not, you're very familiar with the fact that X-ray things look very different in X-ray light than they do in optical light. Right? X-ray picture looks like this, optical picture of your hand, not quite the same. 
And so that is why uh, the we set out to explore the universe, not only in optical light, but also in X-ray light. We wanted to see how things would look different and what would we then see when we looked at things in a totally different wavelength. And so, of course, uh, uh, you are here to celebrate the 20th anniversary uh, of Chandra was actually, uh, the anniversary was July 23rd, which is less than a week ago. We celebrated 20 years since the launch of Chandra, uh, and in December, 20 years since the launch of XMM-Newton, uh, NASA mission, ESA mission. Uh, and so in these 20 years, we've made really a lot of progress, and, and we've learned a lot of things about the universe in a whole new light. So let me go back to this picture, and of course now we want to see what does this look like in x-rays. And we're going to expect that it looks quite different in x-rays than in optical light. This is the exact same part of the sky in x-rays, looks like this. Now, this would have been a bit more impressive if I had the right light, because this pink blob would have actually been big, so you can't quite see the outside part of it. Um, but now let's overlay those two images. So now you've got the optical light and you've got the X-ray light. And the most important thing that you, know, you leave uh, from, this, uh, um, from this talk, uh, knowing that the, in these towns of the universe where galaxies like to live together, the space between galaxies is not empty. Empty space is not empty. Empty space is filled with something that you don't see in optical light, but you can see it in X-ray light. Even more so than that, actually most of the atoms in this part of space are not in the stars. Most of the atoms are in the stuff that you cannot see with visible light. Most of the atoms are in this X-ray gas that fills the space between the galaxies. So finally, we are coming to the point of my talk. Why doesn't the universe have more stars? Why did I ask this? Well, because most of the matter, most of the mass in the picture that I previously showed you, even normal matter, I'm not touching dark matter right now. So most of the normal matter in the picture that I previously showed you, about 90%, is in the X-ray phase. So why aren't all of the atoms in stars? After all, what does the universe have better things to do with its gas than to turn it into stars? Come on, people. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at what the answer is. Let me remind you of this video that we saw before and how the structure forms in the universe. You start out with no structure, everything roughly uniform, and then you make small things. The small things merge together to make bigger things, bigger things, bigger things. Let's see what happens during one of these collisions when two structures merge together. And this is a Chandra image that I think is on most of your uh, postcards. This is what happens. Pink stuff here is X-ray gas. And you can more or less tell if you've ever gone boating and you've seen a boat go through the water and there's a wake in the front of the boat. There's two things crashed into each other and this guy is now going in this direction. These collisions are actually the uh, second most energetic things since the Big Bang itself. There's a lot of energy that is released in these collisions. This is the prettiest such picture where you can clearly see that something has just crashed together, some collision is going on, but we have lots of examples that Chandra has studied. Um, and so when this energy that is you know, the second most energetic thing since the Big Bang, when this energy gets released in these collisions, what happens is that the atoms that were part of this collision become too hot to make stars. At this point, again, you need to take a drink from your beer and say, Aurora, you've lost your mind. What could you possibly mean with this? How can something be too hot to make stars? Aren't stars really, really hot? Well, yes. Um, in this room right now, fortunately, because it's not last week, we have a temperature of about 20 degrees. Uh, the surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees, so it's really, really hot. The gas that we see here, the gas that we study with Chandra, is tens to hundreds of millions of degrees. So it's really, really, really hot. It's too hot to make stars. Now you can say, the next question you should ask is, um, okay, fine. 
oh, the next thing I should tell you is, all right, so, so these uh, x-ray images are very disturbed because things have just crashed together. Uh, if you wait a while, things kind of relax and you just get a, a round blob of x-ray gas. Uh, and the next thing you should say is, okay, so, but what, if I take a cake out of the oven, right, uh, and the cake, when I, you take it out of the oven, is, is too hot to eat, right? But what do you do? You wait. You wait for some time, and then the cake cools down, and then it becomes cool enough to eat it. And so you say, these collisions happen, the gas gets heated up, but then you wait a while, doesn't the gas cool down again and start making stars? Uh, and the next reason for you to drink is because I'm about to say something crazy again, which is um, you can calculate how long time you would need for this gas to cool down to a point where it makes stars again. And the answer is, in most of the parts of this picture, it would take more than the age of the universe for the gas to cool down back to the point where it can make stars. Except the very centers of these objects. Here, the cooling time is relatively short. The gas should cool. It should be making more stars. We've looked for those stars, and they're not being formed. So something weird is going on. So let's now zoom in to these centers. And in these centers, in the center of every cluster of galaxies, is usually a really, really big, fat galaxy, uh, kind of like this guy. And now let's again look at this. So I've zoomed in a lot the previous pictures. Uh, let's look, what does this look like in x-rays? So again, Chandra image of this part of the sky, very different from optical image. Chandra image looks like that. So clearly there's something really funny going on. And since we're in a bar, uh, it looks like someone is blowing bubbles uh, with a straw into a glass of water. But where does the straw come from? All right, let's look. It's going to get crazy. It's only going to get crazier from here, you guys. So remember the optical picture was this galaxy. And we know that at the heart of every galaxy, including the Milky Way, is a really, really massive black hole. And the bigger the, the galaxy, the bigger the black hole. So the black hole in this guy is really enormous. Here's an artist impression of that black hole. And now what happens is there's gas around, and this gas is falling into a black hole. It doesn't fall straight into a black hole, it sort of swirls into a black hole, kind of like water going down the drain, if you will, if I'm lucky. But a very tiny fraction of this, just before falling into the black hole, instead of falling in, gets ejected perpendicular to this disk in the form of jets not crazy, and I'm not imagining any of this stuff. Uh, in fact, we know that black holes exist, and if you're an astronomy enthusiast, you will have seen earlier this year the first ever picture of a black hole that looked like this. A lot of people were disappointed because it's blurry, but I think it's actually ma amazingly beautiful. This is the black hole in M87. This is a nearby really, really fat galaxy. And let's look at what Chandra sees when Chandra looks at, at M87. Now, Chandra doesn't have the resolution to see this guy. So Chandra is looking on much larger scales, and Chandra sees the jet. Everybody sees it? This is the jet that is coming out of that black hole. And now, let's have a look what happens when you have a black hole with this jet, and then you have the surrounding X-ray gas how does that jet interact with this surrounding X-ray gas? So the black hole is right here. This is the surrounding X-ray gas. The black hole is about to launch a bunch of jets. There go the jets. And you see that these jets are blowing exactly this type of bubbles in the surrounding X-ray gas. So that looks very close to the picture that I showed you before. This is the picture that I showed you before. These are the bubbles. All of these bubbles have been blown by the central black hole. This is by far not the only object that we have seen. It's perhaps the most spectacular. Uh, but many, you see here, this is the black hole. Here are the bubbles. This is the black hole. Here are the bubbles. Uh, by the way, th these are different 
uh, colors because x-rays don't really have a color. So it's up to you uh, what color you assign the x-ray emission to be. I personally like purple, maybe you could tell. <laughs> Um, and so these bubbles are ubiquitous, that are blown by uh, the, the supermassive black hole. So I've come to the end of my talk with the answer. Why doesn't the universe have more stars? Well, first of all, it's because during these collisions, where structures merge together to make bigger and bigger structures, during collisions a lot of energy is released, that energy uh, warms up gas to such high temperatures that the gas cannot make stars anymore. Even in the places where the cooling time of this very hot gas is short, the gas cannot make stars because in those places where the cooling time is short, supermassive black holes butt in, they use their jets to mix up the gas, they stir it around, they don't allow it to settle, and they don't allow it to make more stars. So this is my one slide summary uh, that describes why the universe looks the way it does. And uh, I hope you have more than 20 questions and we can uh, distribute all of, all of the, uh, the uh, material. Thank you very much for your attention.